It is now believed that plastic waste can be found on every beach in the world. From the busiest beaches to the most isolated and uninhabited islands, now no shoreline is untouched by plastic pollution. And if the current rate of global production continues, there could be more plastic than fish by weight in our seas by 2050. Here in British Columbia, people have decided enough is enough and are taking strides to stop the tragic destruction of our oceans. Ocean Legacy is a local foundation whose aim is to tackle the growing problem of plastic pollution along the 25,000 kilometers of coastline here. Chloe Dubois is one of the founders. I'm Juliana. I'm Chloe. Nice to meet you. Okay. All right, let's do it. All right. Tell me first. Ladies first. The British Columbia coast is made up of deep inlets and rugged island shorelines, so helicopter travel isn't just a joyride, it's essential. <laughs> Today we're headed to the Klaikwat Sound and one of the 40,000 islands that dot the coastline here. These terrains are a bit tricky. Um, it's really hard to tell just how much debris is actually here because of the logs and rocks. We could spend years cleaning this island alone. It's being estimated that there's about 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean right now, and a lot of those pieces are free to move wherever they want around the planet. Aside from you know the unsightliness of pollution on these gorgeous beaches, what kind of problems do plastic pollution cause? When plastic reaches our oceans, it tends to act as little sponges. So any chemicals that are in the water, it will begin to absorb these chemicals in the plastic pieces. And this is very toxic and very dangerous for marine life. Every day, we're finding the new animal or whale that's been washed ashore with stomachs full of plastic. Given the amount of plastic here, I'm not surprised wildlife is suffering. Can we lift it? Yeah. Oh, gross. Oh, wow, it's a, yeah, you can tell this is an old refrigerator. There's no way we could make a dent cleaning this beach by ourselves. Fortunately, reinforcements are on the way. So the helicopter we came in on are bringing more and more volunteers to this remote area to clean up the beach. So they're bringing in maybe two dozen volunteers today. Many here come from different local environmental groups. Overall, there are 5,000 volunteers to call upon across the region. But with so much coastline to monitor, Chloe and her team rely on tip-offs posted on the Ocean Legacy website to prioritize the most crucial locations. Flip-flops. I have found like 40 flip-flops today. <laughs> are these here. bear marks? Yeah, so these are bear claw marks here in the foam because it smells fishy. So when it washes up on shore, the wildlife um, is searching for food and mistakes the styrofoam for being its food source. Once collected, the plastic is readied for transport back to the mainland. I am going to learn how to sling or attach one of these super sacks um, to a hook um, at the base of the helicopter so that it can lift it out of here. When he drops the hook, I'll grab the hook and run it over to you guys. You hook it up. OK, cool. Since Ocean Legacy started, the team have collected over five tons of plastic off islands like this. And they're keeping most of it out of landfills, too. But what happens to the plastic they collect? Chloe's invited me back to the recycling center in Vancouver to find out. What's the next step in the process? We take all of these random uh, hard plastic items and we're going to shred them up. The fragments will then be sold on to companies who will breathe new life into them. Styrofoam will become picture frames, beach huts, and picnic benches, while bits of old tires will hit the road again as new tires. Ocean Legacy is even starting to engage high street companies such as Lush Cosmetics, who are using recycled plastic for their signature packaging. So in order to make the black pots, we've needed to turn this material, basically, into something that looks like this. So it's still a very small project, but we're looking now in our organization to grow this much larger to engage more industry and more cleanup groups so that uh, we can help create an economic value for these materials. They're organized as a nonprofit foundation, mm -hmm. which means that all their profits get funneled into research, education, and more cleanups. Nothing goes to waste here. 
So, Chloe, what are we turning this into? What's the next step? Right. We'll make fuel out of this. Wait, what? <laughs> How are you turning this into fuel? It's a clever solution. Plastic is made from fossil fuels, after all. To learn more, Chloe's taking me to the boat where they have a prototype of a machine they're developing on a larger scale. We've set our parameters, and the machine is essentially heating up, and we'll start to vaporize the plastics. The plastic is converted into fuel through a process of thermal decomposition called pyrolysis. The machine is airtight and oxygen-free so that the plastic doesn't burn. As the temperature heats up to 410 degrees Celsius, it melts to become a liquid and then a gas. This passes through a tube into a container filled with cool water, where it condenses and forms oil. So who could obtain a machine like this? The larger scale technology that we're looking to develop would be ideal for remote, coastal, or even island communities uh, that don't have readily accessible fuel sources that, and are also inundated with plastic pollution everywhere. It makes sense that these remote communities can use that plastic as a resource towards something that will benefit the community. The machine will take three hours to turn the plastic into fuel. In the meantime, I'm off to check out another project, less focused on recycling and more on changing mindsets. It's at artist and author Douglas Copeland's studio on the other side of town. What are we looking at here? Oh, oh. Giant dolls. Uh, these are, yes, pretty big bobblehead dolls. There's the 20th century, 20th century way of looking at plastic as something shiny and happy and great. Then there's like the reality in the world right now and how we're adjusting to that. And so these guys here, uh, plastic boy, plastic girl, uh, they will be representing the future. These figures are part of Douglas's installation at the Vancouver Aquarium, and I'm getting them ready for their debut. Do you like your new outfit? Oh my God. He says, yeah, look at that. Oh, look at that. Douglas is using 11 tons of ocean plastic in his show. What inspired you to create this installation piece? I go up north, this place called Queen Charlotte Islands. About four years ago, I was up there and plastic bottles were suddenly washing up on my sacred beach. Oh. And it really, it was like an evangelizing moment for me. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, let's make an image of the trash, but one which has a bit of sort of emotional like tingle to it, I guess. Copeland isn't pretending to offer solutions, but he is hoping to engage audiences who ordinarily wouldn't stop to think about the problem. And ultimately, he's hopeful we can turn things around before it's too late. I'm heartened by the energy British Columbia is putting into tackling the problem of plastic pollution. Before I leave, I want to return to the Ocean Legacy boat to see how much fuel the machine has produced. So I'm seeing different colors. Is this the mixed oil separating into different It is, fuels? yeah. So what's going to be coming out of this machine is a mixed oil. And in that oil, we can separate into kerosene oil, diesel fuel, and petroleum products. So you can make electricity from it, uh, power your lawnmower, heat your home. How are you using this fuel? Currently, we're not making enough of the fuel to use it in a practical application. Um, so this is just our small pilot. But we've really got the world's interest right now in launching these units worldwide. The fuel will emit greenhouse gases and other pollutants, but at least it takes plastic out of circulation and reduces the need for fossil fuel extraction. So can we use it in this ship? Well, yeah, let's do it. OK. End of the hold, she goes. Ready? Yeah. That sounds good. Okay. This ship is running on plastic. Ocean Legacy are planning to roll out these machines starting in British Columbia in one year's time. They aren't the first organization to try to turn plastic into fuel or to recycle it. But what impresses me about Chloe and her team is the determination which drives them to take a multi-pronged approach to tackling plastic pollution. It's a problem that won't go away if we continue to use and discard such huge amounts of plastic. But what I've seen here gives me hope that if other groups around the world were to work in similar ways, it could be possible to make a real difference. <laughs>